from Rome. Uh, he was ordained a priest uh, in the Diocese of Fall River um, in June of 1999. From there, he returned to Rome to study moral theology and bioethics at the John Paul II Institute for Marriage and Family. Um, then he returned back to the States, was the par pastor for St. Burdick Parish in Fall River. And then, like I mentioned before, St. Anthony of Padua Parish in New Bedford, Massachusetts, a great place to be from. Um, and then one of the things that Father really has been in the ensuing years is a herald of the gospel. And he's done that through his writings, through his preachings. If you go on his Facebook page and just look at the links that he is always dropping, there's always something new uh, that you can learn from Father Landry. He also does uh, writings for the National Catholic Register and he, whenever he was with, uh, physically with the uh, Fall River Diocese, he was the editor for the anchor. Um, he, regularly, my father would hand me the anchor that was printed out back in the day. And he would be like, here's another Father Landry writing, uh, go read it. And so that was another reason of how um, I got to know Father Landry. Uh, since that time, he's also written The Plan of Life, Habits to Help Grow Closer to God. I actually have a copy of it um, that one of our mutual friends gave to me, and I definitely recommend it. Um, Father also speaks a lot about the theology of the body, which I know a couple of us are very much interested in. And then right now, he is the Holy See's Permanent Observer Mission to the United States, to the United Nations in New York. And then he's also the national chaplain for Catholic Voices USA and the New York chapter of, uh, I'm probably going to butcher this father, but Leon Forum. Leonine. Leonine. Okay. With that, I am pleased to announce Father Roger Landry. Thanks, Anthony. Good evening, everybody. It's good to be with you. Thanks for your love for our country that brought you to Annapolis. I'm looking forward to being with you tonight. I do have to ask Elizabeth Farnan, do you have an uncle named Father Jim? I do, sir. <laughs> Jim's Jim's a very, very close friend of mine, and I used to annihilate him on the ping pong court and in every other way. <laughs> we'll be happy to yes. tell you that. Is your mom Teresa? Yeah. <laughs> Likewise, no Teresa, and I know you aren't Mary very well. Uh, mm -hmm. so, um, good. so good to be with everybody tonight. Um, when Anthony and I were talking about various themes to discuss. We ended up choosing Catholic social teaching in action, the work of the Holy See of the United Nations, which allow us to do a couple things. Uh, talk about Catholic social teaching as well as talk about Holy See diplomacy. And so I've prepared a PowerPoint presentation. There's been a little bit of an issue the last couple of days with when I share, you get my slides rather than the whole big picture, but we'll do the best job that we can it's better than not seeing what I'm going to share with you at all. And at the end of that, then um, I will take your questions on these or any other question that you want. And I know that you've got a hard deadline at the end. And so let's get right into it. The Holy See is a state. It has international juridical personalities, a sovereign state that participates formally in bilateral, that's one-on-one, -on -one, and multilateral, that's in international bodies like the United Nations, the European Union, the African Union, et cetera, multilateral diplomatic work. So when you think of the Holy See, think about a country. Sometimes people, when they look at uh, international state with juridical personality and think about the Catholic Church, they're wondering what gospel that might be found in. And it's not so... Um, explicit there, but there are some preconditions for the work of the church for the common good uh, with political leaders. So Jesus called his followers to be the salt of the earth, and salt had three properties in the ancient world. The first was to prevent things from going to corruption, and we try to prevent culture from corroding. The second was as a fire starter still today, and Lots of developing nations, you'll mix salt with dung and light it on fire to serve as charcoal. It's kind of gross, but it's used and it's very effective. So salt was meant to be a fire starter. And Jesus believers are supposed to be fire starters with regard to what's good. And salt obviously is 
meant to add flavor and life. We try to bring a little bit of vitality to the world. Jesus called us to be the light of the world. So that kind of like uh, the lights on a uh, runway at night in a storm, they can allow pe people to come to safety. They can guide. The light also warms. And so Christian believers are supposed to help people see the light of the truth and warm them so that they'll love it and choose it. And Jesus also calls us to be leaven that can make the whole dough of the world rise. And so all three of those images, salt, light, and leaven, have a clear aspect of not hiding behind walls in some type of pseudo-Benedict option, but going out and transforming the world. And Jesus, when he was asked by the lawyer about paying taxes to Caesar, made a very important distinction, not just with regard to church and state in the church's prerogatives, but also with regard to how the church is supposed to influence the state, to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. That's a religious duty. It's not quite as important as rendering to God the things that are God, but we're supposed to pray for our leaders. We're supposed to help our leaders. We're supposed to take up our duty as citizens. And so there is a biblical ground to the way that the church has interacted in the political arena pretty much since the beginning. Prior to 313 with the Edict of Milan, Christianity was basically illegal. So all that we did was under the surface and there were 13 ferocious anti-Christian persecution. But after the um, Battle of the Milvian Bridge between Constantine and his brother-in-law, Maxentius, and the um, the desire of Constantine to thank the Christian God who had given him the sign in the heavens that delivered him the western half of the Roman Empire. He in Milan, October 28, 312, pronounced an edict that made Christianity legal. Christianity didn't become the official religion of the Roman Empire until the end of the 300s. But with the Edict of Milan, it was now free. And what Constantine did, because Christians didn't lie, is he wanted a lot of Christians in his civil service. And he took the Christian leaders based on 1 Corinthians 7, when we're not supposed to sue fellow Christians in civil court. And he made the bishops, leaders of the Christians, civil magistrates, so that they would be able to settle disputes among Christians in a sort of parallel court system. From that point forward, church leaders had some type of role in, um, in civil administration. Um, oh, before we move on, I just want to make a little bit of a distinction about the term Holy See. It comes from Sancta Sedes, which means holy chair or holy seat. See is an old English word for seat, S-E-A-T. And seat refers to the Pope. When we celebrate February 22nd, the Feast of the Chair of St. Peter, we're not celebrating furniture, but we're symbol, uh, celebrating a symbol, a symbol of teaching authority. In the ancient world, teachers sat and students stood as they took notes. The modern equivalent, for example, of a chair in the ancient world might be a judge's bench or gavel today that symbolized the authority of the one exercising that authority. And so when we talk about a sancta sedes, we're talking about the authority of the Pope in the civil arena. Um, and that goes back to the fourth century. The Holy See is the longest continuous diplomatic corps in the world. The Holy See itself is distinct from the Vatican City State. The Holy See is in charge of the Vatican City State, but it's distinct. The Vatican City State has actual geography and enters, for example, into treaties on postal service or telecommunications. But the Holy See is the uh, uh, um, juridical personality of the Holy Father and everyone with him. In the history of the development of diplomacy, most states were monarchies. And so the entire state was summarized by the monarch. And that's what you'll still see civilly with the Holy See, that the Pope is a monarch and everybody immediately working with him is part of the Holy See. So the Roman Coria, the diplomatic corps, et cetera. It's also Holy See distinct from the Catholic Church. The Holy See in a sense um, represents all Catholics throughout the world, but 
every Catholic is in a member of the Holy See. There's a distinction between the international juridical person and the Catholic Church as a religious institution. And in the United Nations, sometimes people think that the Holy See is there as a privileged religious body rather than as a state, uh, but we're there as a juridical uh, personality in international law, not so much as a privileged religion. When you start to look at the development of Holy See diplomacy over the course of centuries, the first terms, which you see with Pope Leo the Great, for example, in 451, 452, he was the apocrisarius of the Pope when he was still a deacon to the emperor in Constantinople. Apocrisari basically means emissary. Legate or legati in Latin is, we would still have the term today, like an emissary or an ambassador. And the nuncius was the term that still is used today for a papal representative of uh, before the United Nations or likewise before the president of the United States in Washington and the United States, et cetera. So those are all three ancient terms in Greek and Latin respectively to symbolize the persons who are carrying out Holy See's diplomacy. That is very interesting. That, um, let's see if that works, okay. Um, brief little history of Holy See diplomacy. Eventually there was the development of the civil authority of the Pope with Constantine beyond. Property would be ceded to the Pope and he would begin to manage it. And after the fall of the Roman Empire, there was total chaos in Rome and elsewhere. And the people came to the popes to look to somebody with authority to organize sewage, organize the aqueducts, organize police forces, organize military against um, invading armies and the rest. And sort of by default, the Pope became a civil leader. There's a famous story when Attila the Hun was approaching Rome and destroying the garrisons in the north and central parts of Italy, the old Roman Senate, which were pretty much empty togas at the time, went to Pope Leo and said, you're the only one who can stop Attila the Hun from coming and destroying Rome. Can you do something? And so he went up to Mantua, intercepted um, Attila the Hun, offered a tribute that Attila took, and Attila went north. And so you can see just how the peoples in Italy and beyond were relying on the civil authority of the Pope in this vacuum that had happened after the fall of the Roman Empire. Pope Gregory VII in the middle or toward the end of the 11th century really started to codify um, Holy See diplomacy and organize it in a much more formal way. Diplomacy as we speak about it today really began about a hundred years after that in the 13th century in Northern Italy and what we would typically call consuls today where the mercantile um, phenomena had begun and the various city states would send their economic representatives to other city states in order to try to promote trade. And those were the first diplomats, consuls as we would call them today. It's one of the things that consuls do is promote economic interests beyond just helping with visas, et cetera. Eventually in the age of global exploration colonization after Columbus discovered this hemisphere for Europe, the papacy was an arbiter. So when Portugal and Spain, for example, didn't want to go to war over what was gonna be happening in Latin America, they turned to the Pope to say, can you help us settle our disputes amicably? And the popes did, and including some of the worst popes of all time were extraordinarily influential in solving those problems so that it wouldn't lead to war. A little bit later, the Protestant Reformation happened, which was an earthquake with regard to Holy See diplomacy. Prior, you know, the Pope had representatives everywhere. We called them bishops. After the Protestant Reformation, various whole swathes of territory were, was no longer Catholic and bishops were basically kicked out. So how would the Pope relate there at the civil level and so there started to be the exchange of diplomatic representation. Peace of Augsburg in 1555 was to settle the dispute between Catholics and Lutherans and came up with the principle that the religion of the leader, civil leader of that territory um, would become the religion of the whole territory. 
the Edict of Nantes settled a dispute between Catholics and Calvinists. And the Peace of Westphalia, much larger, it solved the 30 um, year war that was taking place between Catholics and Protestants in general. And so after each of those, there was a growth in trying to settle disputes amicably rather than on the battlefield. There was a huge rupture in the history of diplomacy in general, not just policy diplomacy with the French Revolution, because Napoleon broke every convention that was known. He was stealing diplomatic mail. He was arresting um, heads of state like the Pope, which he did twice, um, arresting various ambassadors. The rest of it, it was a mess. So after Napoleon, there was this Council of Vienna, which established many of the diplomatic protocols and privileges that we still have today. The period between 1870 and 1929 was huge for Holy See diplomacy because in 1870, Italy was born through the, um, through the suppression of the papal city states and the formation of a new nation. And the papacy became a voluntary captive of the Vatican. So while the Holy See existed as an international juridical personality, it had no longer any geographical circumscription. This isn't the only time it's happened. Like for example, Poland was wiped off the map between the Council of Vienna in 1815 and the end of World War I. So for 103 years, it was a Polish nation, but not a Polish state. And that's happened to multiple other circumstances over the course of time. But during that time between 1870 and 1929, there was a, an explosive growth of bilateral relations. People were still very much interested in entering into relations with the Holy See, even though there was no property associated with it. And in 1929, there were the Lateran Accords between the Holy See and the state of Italy, creating the Vatican City State as the geographical circumscription um, led by the Holy See. And then at the time of the League of Nations after World War I, and then during World War II, there was the growth of multilateral diplomacy so that we wouldn't have World War III, the Cold War, was a time in, in the sort of end of colonization in which most countries throughout the world entered into dip, formal diplomatic relations with the Holy See. The United States entered in under President Reagan in 1984. Um, so now the Holy See is bilateral diplomatic relations with 183 countries. The only country that has more one-on-one -on -one diplomatic relations is the United States of America, which is pretty phenomenal. The Holy See has diplomatic relations, likewise with the European Union, the sovereign military order of Malta, relations of a special nature with the state of Palestine. We participate in various intergovernmental organizations and bodies and programs. The Vatican City State also participates in lots of international treaties that govern things like the post office, telecommunications, satellites, um, et cetera. What are the Holy See's goals of engagement? The Holy See, unlike Canada, the US, Togo, et cetera, is not concerned principally with what most states are, borders, economic benefits, military security. What we're really interested in is articulating the ethical principles that ought to underpin the social and political order on the basis of universally applicable principles that are as real as the physical elements of the natural environment. So the dignity of the human person um, the common good, solidarity, subsidiarity, uh, the family, uh, democracy. I mean, there are a whole bunch of things that we are interested in. And because we don't have the same political and economic interests, we're able to transcend some of those questions and provide neutral guidance to countries that are seeking their own um, individual national good. So when the United Nations was being conceived during World War II, fundamentally, it was uh, an agreement sketched out by the United States, the United Kingdom, and the USSR. Pope Pius XII, who was a consummate diplomat, was expressing some concerns at the proposal. The first is, he said, you would never really be able, like the League of Nations failed. It was never approved by the US Senate. Uh, and it failed um, 
because it really didn't have international buy-in. I mean, there are lots of issues that we could get into that I don't so much want to spend too much time on, but we didn't want to have another failure. But we recognized that there was a need for some type of deliberative body so that every dispute wouldn't have to be settled on the battlefield. When Pius XII was looking at the sketch of the United Nations, he saw two huge concerns. The first was you couldn't have an international organization that purported toward the equality of nations if two or five nations, excuse me, were palpably unequal, what we still call the permanent five members of the Security Council, the United States, the then USSR, which is now the Russian Federation, um, China, the United Kingdom and France. The reason why you had the P5 was none of the countries really wanted to sign up for something if eventually you could strong arm enough developing countries to be able to suppress the legitimate national interests of other countries. And so you gave each country, the, the major countries a veto so that nothing would happen at the Security Council which would make international law that would violate those national interests. At the time, in 1945, th those five countries that I've just named had 80% of the soldiers in the world. Now it's about 27% of the soldiers in the world. And so whole continents are wondering why they don't have equality in the Security Council, like Latin America or uh, Africa. Um, but that remains a concern and a lot of the problems in the United Nations happens because countries veto the international common good for the sake of national interest. We could just take a couple examples. The Soviet, the Soviets, the Russian Federation vetoes anything to deal with the human rights atrocities that still occur in Syria. Likewise, the United States of America vetoes anything that has to do with Israel evicting um, Palestinian settlements and Palestinian territory and saying, you used to live here. <laughs> and the, uh, those are some issues because of alliances between certain countries. There are always a veto, even when everybody else recognizes that there's a human rights abuse that has taken place. And so there's been an attempt to say that countries shouldn't exercise their veto when a human rights atrocity is occurring, but the P5 won't even agree to that. And so it is one of the major concerns that Pius XII expressed in 1942, 1943, that's still very relevant. The second was about the General Assembly. He said the resolutions of the General Assembly more or less were exhortations that had no teeth to them. They were all subject to national implementation. Now there's a good side to that at, at the same time, but he said, if there is no teeth, then what would happen to the General Assembly is it's just gonna become the world's most prestigious debating society because any country that's doing something obviously wrong wouldn't have to follow what the resolution of the UN General Assembly had adopted. And he said, that would lead to just a whole bunch of words without the types of deeds that would be necessary. And that likewise is a problem 76 years in to the UN's history. There's an overlap between the four pillars of the United Nations and the preamble of the charter and Catholic social teaching, which is key for us and we focus on it a lot. The first pillar was to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. And the Catholic church has been seeking to be peacemakers since Christ proclaimed the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. To reaffirm faith and fundamental human rights and the dignity and worth of the human person and the equal rights of men and women and the nations large and small. And the Catholic Church has been promoting human dignity and the rights that flow from it from well before we even had the expression human rights. To establish conditions under which justice and respect for obligations arising from treaties and other sorts of international law can be obtained, can be maintained. And even what you see in the fifth century, Catholic Church was talking about the Latin expression pacta sunt servanda, the treaties that, agree, that agreements have to be kept because if they're not kept, if your word's not good, there'll be no trust and all of society will break down. 
and fourth, to promote social progress and better standards of life and larger freedom. That's basically talking about integral development, lifting the poor out of poverty and what will ensure that people are able to thrive. And the Catholic Church, especially through religious all over the world in education, healthcare, um, so many different social works has been trying to lift the poor out of poverty um, since Christ told us that we would always have the poor with us and whatever we do to the poor, we do to him. And so there is a clear um, reason why the Holy See inspired by Catholic social teaching would want to be present at the United Nations. Prior to the Holy See's having a formal relationship, there was involvement. I'm not gonna go in detail through this, but in the early years of the UN, the UN was founded with only 51 countries in 1945 and eventually it grew now it's 193 countries. But the UN would often invite the Holy See in areas of her expertise to participate in the UN meetings like in the 1951 Geneva Convention on the Status of Refugees because Catholics cared for refugees, especially through the World War II and what happened after World War II in these refugee camps all over the world. So we had an expertise we could bring. Participated in UNESCO um, and the Apostolic Nuncio in Paris who was there was the future John the 23rd. We participated in the UN Conference on the Peaceful Use of Nuclear Energy taking place in 1955, 10 years after the nuclear bombs in Japan. We participated in the Food and Agricultural Organization, the Conference of the Law of the Sea, and many of these meetings with an auxiliary bishop from New York who was always invited to, to uh, pay attention as an observer, and he was constantly filing reports with the Holy See. But in the early 1960s, frankly, the UN was in trouble. Um, it hadn't accomplished much in its first 20 years, and people were wondering whether it was worth the money, whether it was just going to die. So the Secretary General at the time, Utan, appealed to now St. Paul VI, who was Pope at the time, if he would be able to give a pep talk. And so he was inviting the Pope to come to New York and the Pope recognized that before he would speak, he should speak with some type of status here at the United Nations. And so there was an exchange of letters that made the Holy See a permanent observer state at the United Nations. There were plenty of other permanent observer states and that second bullet point, you can see that at any given time, there were up to 16. And the Holy See became a permanent observer state 57 years ago last week. Eventually though, all of these other states left permanent observer status and became full member states. In 2002, when Switzerland did, the UN approached the Holy See and asked whether we would wanna become a full member at the UN as well. St. John Paul II thought about it for about 18 months and came back and said, we'd, pre we'd prefer to remain a permanent observer so that we would be able to be neutral to a lot of the purely sort of political, economic and military matters so that we would be able to continue to do what we think we're best at. But we asked for a formal declaration of the rights and responsibilities of observer states. There had been in the UN charter, no mention of observer states and we just, chose that term observer because other multi multilateral bodies had such a status. But the Holy See thought it would be worthwhile, especially because some international abortion agencies were trying to get the Holy See kicked out of the UN to have some type of general assembly resolution governing our status. So that happened in 2004. And the Holy See gained all the rights and responsibilities of any member state at the UN, except the right to vote the right to submit resolutions without co-sponsoring. We can co-sponsor, but not sponsor. The right to put forward candidates for the various UN and UN related offices. No big deal on any of those because most of the resolutions are adopted by 100% consensus and all the issues are worked out ahead of time in negotiation. For any resolution to pass, you basically need 97 states. One of the others would be able to introduce it. And we're not really interested in running, but accompanying people from the side. Um, in 2012, the state of Palestine was granted permanent observer status. And so now the Holy See is one of two permanent observer states at the UN. When you look at the messaging of the Holy See and the priorities, you can really look at it from the context of the five people visits the United Nations. 
Pope Paul VI in 1965, John Paul II came twice in 79 and 95. Pope Benedict came in, sorry, that's a typo, 2008. And Pope Francis came in 2015 and I was brought on to the staff to help manage that visit at the UN, which was a great learning experience and great privilege. When the popes have come, they've essentially stressed several main points that I synthesize for us here. The first is esteem for the institution, which they consider essential to the world. Um, if it didn't exist, it would have to be founded so that the countries of the world would be able to come together and try to resolve some issues in a multilateral way so that it doesn't have to be done the hard way. And so that um, midshipmen at the US Naval Academy don't have to lose their lives um, because we because diplomats couldn't do their job. Um, so huge esteem for the institution as a body that embodies the hopes of so many peoples for peace. But they've always stressed that the UN is ever in need of reform so that it may live up to the hopes that the peoples of the world place in it. As you'll see, as I explicitate on these bullet points, the UN popes have said is a temporal reflection of Catholicity, aspiring to serve all peoples everywhere, just like the church does. That the UN is meant to be a school of peace, essential for the building and maintenance of peace, which we become first students at that school and then peripatetic professors throughout the world. They've stressed that to carry out this mission of peace, the UN must help nations in the international community to live up to its responsibilities, especially to protect people who are suffering human rights abuses, like we saw in the Holocaust and the various other genocides. That there's a need for true justice, not just words. And that the UN must promote and protect the dignity of every person, beginning with promoting and protecting respect for the sacredness of human life. Let's flesh out some of those points with some direct quotes. First, esteem for the institution. St. Paul VI in 1965 said he wanted his message to be a moral and solemn ratification of this lofty institution. That the edifice of constructing must never collapse. It must be continuously perfected and adapted to the needs of the, uh, to the, needs of the history of the world will present. John Paul II, how can we fail to acknowledge the role of the UN 50 years after its founding, the need for such an organization is even more obvious. Benedict in 2008, my presence is a sign of the esteem for the UN and it's intended to express the hope that the organization will increasingly serve as a sign of unity between states and an instrument of service to the entire family. Francis said, I follow in the footsteps of my predecessors who expressed their great esteem for the organization which they consider the appropriate juridical and political response to this present moment of history. But it's likewise always need a reform to rise above the cold status of an administrative institution and become a moral center where all the nations of the world feel at home and develop a shared awareness of being, as it were, a family of nations. That it has to be an institution that defends the human rights elancated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. And the reform is that it doesn't live up to its ideals and that national interests trump the international common good. The, this point I've, I've always been touched, at, uh, touched by since I first read Paul VI's address in 1965, which is a masterpiece. He said that we'd be tempted to say that the chief characteristic of the UN is a reflection, as it were, in the temporal field of what the Catholic Church aspires to be in the spiritual field, unique and universal. Among the ideals by which mankind is guided, one can conceive of nothing greater on the natural level. Your vocation is to make brothers, not only of some, but of all people. A difficult undertaking? Without question. But this is the undertaking, your very noble one. So that the UN would do in a political and diplomatic sphere what the Catholic Church tries to do in a spiritual one. The UN is meant to be a building for the preservation of peace and a school of peace. Pope Paul VI said again, was it not principally for the purpose of peace that the United Nations came into being? It is peace, peace that must guide the destinies of peoples and all mankind. The UN is the great school where education in the way of peace is imparted, and we are today in the assembly of that school, 
Everyone taking his place here becomes a pupil and also a teacher in the art of building peace. This is the finest aspect of the UN, its most truly human one. To carry out this mission of peace, it must help nations in the international community to live up to the responsibility to protect. I hope at the Naval Academy, you're all studying this responsibility to protect. Throughout the centuries, there was a principle of just war, which was trying to limit people's retaliation or preemptive strikes, saying that there's got to be just reasons to enter into war and just conduct during war. But now there's this responsibility to protect because there's a duty when countries are attacking its own citizens and committing human rights atrocities for the international community to intervene. Um, somebody's got to protect these people. And the problem today is we wash our hands when things are happening like they're happening in Northwestern China with the Uyghurs, like it's happening in Northern Nigeria to Christians in their churches on Sundays, that's happening to the Christians in the Middle East, that's happening in so many places. There is a real responsibility here that the church has worked very hard to make sure that the United Nations doesn't sure. There's a need for justice, not true words. Pope Francis in 2015 said, our world demands of all governments a will that's effective, practical, and constant, such as the magnitude of the situations and their toll that we must avoid every temptation to fall into what he called the declarationalist nominalism, but just making resolutions with no teeth that assuage our consciences because we say the right things, but they're not effective. We must ensure that our institutions are truly effective in the struggle against all the scourges. And promoting and protecting human dignity necessarily involves promoting and protecting respect for the sacredness of every human life. Pope Francis stressed, the common home of all men and women must continue to rise in the foundation of a right understanding of universal fraternity and respect for the sacredness of every human life, for every man and every woman, the poor, the elderly, the children, the infirm, the unborn, the unemployed, the abandoned, those considered disposable because they're only considered part of a statistic. Many people before the Pope came were trying to say that we on the staff of the Holy See hadn't gotten a papal memo that he was underemphasizing abortion. So we stressed with him, Holy Father, please stress that we're with you. And he didn't just mention it once, he mentioned it four times in his address so that nobody would ever be able to make that mistake or that false accusation again. How do we actually work here? The Pope is represented by a permanent observer, a papal nuncio, um, and he's got a team. We're presently now under Archbishop Gabriele Caccia, who is an Italian from Milan who arrived in 2019. Um, I likewise worked with Archbishop Bernadito Alza here for most of his tenure. And we'll finish with some of the present and perennial priorities of the Holy See. Peace, as I've already mentioned, protection and the advance of fundamental human rights. First, with peace, what are some of the aspects of it? Trying to prevent nuclear war and nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction, weapons that can um, lead to armed vigilante groups and things like we saw with ISIS. Uh, fundamental human rights, and there are many there, the right to life. We work very hard with many others against human trafficking, for example, today. Uh, development and seeking to lift the poor out of poverty in so many ways, especially through education, healthcare, and protection of the environment freedom, especially religious freedom and freedom of conscience is being attacked across the globe into cultural dialogue and into religious dialogue, which shows states how to get along and how to talk with each other, even when they may have some intractable disagreements. General support for democratic institutions is what's most in accord with human dignity and human freedom. Care for those on the move, migrants and refugees. Um, so that kids, for example, don't have to spend 20 years in a refugee camp. Think about if you were in a refugee camp for that length of period of time. Um, migrants in general who are fleeing from environmental disasters, political disasters, um, religious persecution, so many others, we really do have to promote a culture of welcoming and integration. Care for our common home, which is one of the things that's now with the grain um, in most situations, so that we're able to be good stewards of the great gift that God has given us. And 
in summary, there is a social content of the proclamation of our faith of the curricula. Pope Francis at the end of his beautiful exhortation on the joy of the gospel said that the curriculum has a clear social content. The gospel has an immediate moral implications centered on love of neighbor, out of love for God. And that's more than just loving individuals, that's creating the context in which they can thrive. Our redemption has a social dimension because God in Jesus redeemed not only the individual person, but also social relations existing between men. Called us to turn the other cheek, he turned, called us to forgive 70 times, seven times, called us to go that second mile. Pope Francis said, reading the scriptures makes clear that the gospel is not merely about our personal relationship with God, nor should our loving response to God be seen simply as an accumulation of small personal gestures to individuals in need, a kind of charity a la carte, or a series of acts aimed solely at easing our conscience. Gospel is about the kingdom of God. It's about loving God who reigns in the world. To the extent that he reigns within us, the life of society will be a setting for universal fraternity, justice, peace, and dignity. Both Christian preaching and life then are meant to have an impact on society, salt, light, and leaven again. True Christian hope, which seeks the eschatological kingdom, the kingdom that will come, always, he says, makes history. It enters into history. It changes history. These are the convictions that undergird the international diplomatic work at Holy See. It's part of the church is seeking to be the salt of the earth, the light of the world, and the leaven that raises the world. If you weren't able to see the slides very well, because I don't know exactly what's going on with the shared screen, you could go to catholicpreaching.com and download a copy of these slides, which could um, help you to follow through with it. I'll also put up a video of the talk as well as an audio there after we're done tonight. And now I'm really looking forward to questions and discussions with you with, uh, with the time that we have left. Thanks very much for your attention, everybody.